three, two, one. Hello. Um, hello, people. Welcome to the Committee on Community Resources. Um, we are uh, broadcasting live today. Uh, we have a special meeting that's going to feature four presenters from different community organizations. And for those of you tuning in via Facebook or YouTube or channel 15, we welcome you. Um, I, it kind of goes without saying, but this meeting is being uh, both audio and video recorded. Um, if it weren't, we wouldn't be having this meeting today. So um, informing you of that. Um, so, uh, first off, um, let's call the meeting to order and, um, that, uh, Laura, could you call the roll? Sure. Um, Councillor Nash. Here. Councillor Foster. Hmm. Oh, do I have to? Uh, maybe I'll come back to her. Councillor Foster? Uh, Should She's Sorry, mute. when when you started sharing your screen, I lost my mute unmute button. Got it. Here. I'm here. Okay, Councillor Jarrett here, and Councillor Thorpe here. Excellent. Everybody is here, um, and uh, the first the, the the next thing on our agenda is public comment. Um, I believe we have a person uh, waiting on the line to speak to us. Uh, I believe it's Hildegard Friedman, and Hildegard. You have the floor yes. for three minutes. Go for yes. it. Yes. Hildegard Friedman, Public Housing, G68 Cahill. I want to say that incomparable challenges must be met with incomparable bravery and, of course, much more. The Survival Center as I, in public housing, have experienced it over the last few years, had a vast selection of every imaginable kind of food an enormous quantity. Well, perhaps not Coquille Saint-Jacques, but a great, great quantities for endless thousands who came in for varying shifts. But and this is a rather large, but much to my chagrin, it was unbearably crowded uh, with bumper to bumper, elbow to elbow people, children crawling all over the ground. And even in less formidable days, when we had the flu epidemics in the last few years, it was obnoxious in that regard. I suggest that we use the building for something else and that the council, the mayor and others consider the possibility of the World War II Club. You could have workshops as well in the World War II Club, which of course is for sale. And it's strategically located between McDonald and Salvo housing. And how are we getting through uh, this is a parenthesis coming in at the end. How are we getting through to those people who are not in public housing, the starving poor people, newly starving poor, who've lost their jobs, their professions, and their businesses? Please be brave. This is Hildegard. Thank you for those comments, Hildegard. Um, and as you probably know, the Survival Center is one of our presenters today. And yes. I expect they'll probably be able to speak to some of those things. Um, you have another minute if you'd like to share a little more. Well, I've gotten close to some people there. Heidi, your director, I accosted at our last indoor meeting, and I'm very, very fond of her. But I, there were people coughing, and it wasn't in the vast epidemic that we're in now. But I remember the last experience I had, I was asking her, where are the masks? Because there are people coughing, and she said, well, we have masks when they ask for masks. So I, you know, it's, the building is bad. That's, that's 
irrelevant to what I just said, and I know very, very well uh, the directed program director as well, and they know me, including my bad, my bad qualities. <laughs> well, thank you for sharing today, Hildegard. Um, okay. Your, your three minutes is up, and um, yes. I look forward to talking with you on the phone. And um, I'm sure that the uh, Surv Survival Center will um, uh, speak to uh, the concerns you raised. So thank you for calling in. And feel free to listen in on the meeting. I will. I'll be here till the end. Great. Okay. Um, next up on the agenda is the minutes from the previous meeting. Um, um, Council. And uh, Councillor Nash, did you want to see if anyone else wanted, or do you recognize all oh, the Oh, is there somebody else? I did admit a few other people while- um, Oh, let's here. see if there's other people who would like to provide co public comment. Um, I don't know if we need to take any action to unmute them or simply to invite a specific individual to speak. Um, oh. Jim, this is Devin Bruce. I'm just testing this for you. Can you hear me? I, I can hear you, Devin. So you're just calling to listen in. Okay. Yes. And I'm just mentioned, I'm just uh, being verbal so that you all can see how it would work. And I'll go back on mute myself now. Okay. Thank you, Devin. Is there anybody else who might want to share during public comment? Thanks for slowing me down, Laura. <laughs> I don't see any raised hands. Looks like okay. we're going to proceed. All right. So, hearing nobody um, protesting me moving on, uh, let's move on to uh, item number three. Three, which is the minutes of our previous meeting. Um, have uh, I'm hoping counselors have had a chance to review them. Could I have a motion to approve the minutes from the previous meeting? Motion to approve. Second. Okay. Um, any discussion on the minutes? Okay, all in favor? Oh, we need to oh. do a roll call. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. Laura, could you do sure. a roll call? Sure. Uh, yep. Um, Councillor Nash. Yes. Councillor Jarrett. Yes. Councillor Thorpe. Yes. And Councillor Foster. Yes. All right. Thank you, everybody. So we've gotten our business out of the way. Um, and now on to the featured part of our meeting, which is to um, so today we've invited uh, four different presenters to join us uh, and speak to uh, the efforts their organizations have been working on uh, during the COVID-19 crisis. Now, uh, we all realize that many businesses and organizations are, are very stressed at this time and doing amazing things, but these uh, four organizations in particular uh, stood out. Uh, they were all rec recommended by different members of uh, this committee. And so we've invited people to come in and speak and, you know, and talk about, uh, first of all, give us a brief overview of their organization. Second, explain to us, you know, the, the, um, the, the challenges and uh, uh, dire conditions that they've had to address uh, over the last three months. And also, uh, to provide provide uh, people in the us and the community the uh, different ways that we can help them in their efforts. Um, the four organizations are the Survival Center, the United Way of Hampshire County, Safe Passage, and Western Mass Mutual Aid. Um, and we're going to lead off uh, with Heidi Norton Smith with the Survival Center. And Heidi, I think you're here, correct? I am here. Okay, there you are. Hello. <laughs> Hi, how's my sound quality? Is this okay? You sound great. And I love the red chair and the red shirt. And 
and actually even a red shade on the window there. It's a very nice look. <laughs> Feeling <laughs> rosy, I guess. Um, all set, Jim? Shall I go? Yeah, so the, okay. the floor is yours. And uh, just, to, just to review with uh, my colleagues, that we're gonna uh, provide somewhere between 10 to 13 minutes for people to present. Uh, we, um, uh, that we'll have a little time for questions, but we're gonna kind of move crisply through things here. And that, um, so we can say thank you and good work, but we don't, don't need to take 10 minutes to do that the way we usually do. Okay. <laughs> Heidi, Sounds the floor great. is yours. All right, well, thank you very much, Jim, and all of you. It's nice to see so many um, familiar and friendly faces and to hear Hildegard's lovely voice as well, another familiar person. Um, I'm Heidi Norton-Smith, and I'm the Executive Director of the Northampton Survival Center. Um, just a little bit of background for viewers who don't know, we are a food pantry serving 18 communities throughout Hampshire County. Uh, ordinarily, we serve about 4,100 clients during the course of a year, and we distribute about 3,000 pounds of food every weekday. We're open every day, of the, every weekday. Um, and one of the uh, highlights of our program is that we are considered a choice pantry, which means, just as Hildegard was alluding to in her public comments, um, clients come and they choose for themselves what items they want, and that's very important for them and for us. That's a cornerstone of what we typically do. So I've organized my remarks into three phases as I see them. And I did have to make notes because it's been a whirlwind of a, of a few months. Um, the three phases are the early urgent response, building the community food distribution project and ramping up and settling in. So I'll take those in turns. Um, for the early urgent response in early March, uh, as soon as it became clear what we were starting to face with this COVID-19 pandemic, we made a decision to begin offering our clients extra food, really about as much extra food as we possibly could, with the intention that as we learned how to uh, flatten the curve and that staying home and staying away from grocery stores and other public spaces was gonna be useful and helpful, we wanted to enable our clients to take home as much food as possible to be able to stay safely in their homes. Uh, we still offered choice at that time. And uh, basically we focused on precautions. So we were messaging to people about illness, messaging about cover your cough and wash your hands and using signage and so forth. Um, for those of you familiar with the Survival Center, we are a very lean operation. That includes seven full-time staff and about 370 volunteers over the course of a year, many of whom are in their 60s, 70s, or 80s, which of course you can imagine is gonna become relevant as the weeks progress in my timeline. Uh, so we operate out of a beautiful re rebuilt building um, that we, we re rebuilt 10 years ago, but it's a very narrow, long, narrow space, and it makes it very, very difficult to physically distance from one another, especially if you start thinking about bringing 3,000 pounds of food in and out of the building every day. Um, it's very difficult, and in some cases, just impossible to pass one another, um, just even walking, let alone carrying heavy loads and, and so forth. Um, and so between the fact that we had dozens of volunteers in the building every day and we're feeding between 90 and 100 clients a day, it's a very busy and, and um, as, as we heard, a very crowded space. Mm -hmm. In mid-March, we moved our distribution outside. And so what that required was that we, instead of offering choice, which is a, that hallmark, uh, we had to pre-bag food. Um, but we, that enabled us to bring food outside to clients in their cars. And so we were really at that moment assuring their physical distance from one another and from us, which felt very reassuring, I think, on, in all directions. And we felt proud to have been able to do that so quickly. Um, keeping clients physically safe in distance was one thing, but volunteers were not necessarily feeling that same way. Uh, and over the course of a couple of weeks, many, many of our volunteers, probably some 80% or more, uh, felt either that they needed to stay home to self-quarantine or were getting urgent urgings from their children across the nation to please stay home and not come out and volunteer. Um, so we, we did end up having a lot of new volunteers come to us. People are um, eager to help, uh, but that, include, that created more crowding. And there was one day I'm aware of where we actually had 53 new volunteers in the space 
that probably under normal conditions now, we would rather have between eight and 10. So it was feeling very jam packed. Uh, we were moving more food, we were doing it more quickly and we were doing it with fewer people. By late March, we, our overworked staff, uh, started to actually get physically sick. And possibly that was related to the virus, possibly it wasn't. Uh, nobody could get tested at that point, and so we will never know. But we did consult, uh, very enthusiastically consulted medical and public health advisors, and we were told, listen, you got to assume that every, everyone has to assume that they've been exposed. So with uh, four out of seven staff being unable to come to work, over a very short span of time, it became clear that we had to close the building and take some time to regroup. And that moves us to phase two, which is the building the community food distribution project. And right now I just have to do a shout out to, because I see my friend Elisa Klein um, here on the call and uh, you definitely need to know that she's intimately involved in this stage as well. So we were immediately in touch with a huge array of our usual community partners. We have lots and lots of you know, decades of uh, wonderful partnerships in the community. And people were reaching out to us with lots of questions and concerns but it was a bit difficult because we didn't yet know what we were going to do next. And we were still getting our bearings uh, from our new, now remote, uh, socially distanced work environments. Um, but two partners in particular reached out very quickly with offers saying, you know, how can we help? And Elisa Klein from Growth Food Northampton was one and Claire Higgins from Community Action Pioneer Valley was the other. And this uh, growing partnership grew to include uh, among others, the city of Northampton uh, the Northampton Public Schools, Florence Bank, the Food Bank of Western Massachusetts, the Community Foundation, and many others. So happily, just one week later, on April 6, we were able to sort of re, uh, re, reposition ourselves as the Community Food Distribution Project. And what that looks like is it's, it's located at Jackson Street School primarily. We offer drive-up food distribution on Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays from 12 to 3. I'll say that again for any viewers who may be finding themselves in need of food. Every Monday, Wednesday, Friday from 12 to 3 at Jackson Street School in Northampton, you can come and food will be uh, brought out to your car. It is, uh, you can come back every week. And this food is coming directly to Jackson Street School and it's going out from there. So uh, it no longer requires the, um, the bottleneck of the smaller building at the Survival Center. It's pre-bagged groceries. These are shelf-stable, refrigerated, frozen, and bountiful, bountiful fresh produce as well. And we're able to do all of this from the huge cafeteria at Jackson Street School, and also within the big circular driveway outside, which really makes the movement of people and food very, very um, efficient and very socially distant, which is nice. Grow Food Northampton is participating in a very uh, um, instrumental way, very much centered on uh, buying fresh produce from local farmers and supporting local agriculture in that way. And then delivering bags of food on Tuesdays and Thursdays. So those two days that we're not distributing from Jackson Street School, that's because Grow Food Northampton is taking the food around to 11 different housing communities around town. So that would be Hampshire Heights, Meadowbrook Apartments, Florence Heights, the Lumberyard, the Pioneer Valley Workers Center, McDonald House, Walter Salvo House, Cahill Apartments, Four Sander Apartments, Michael's House, and Tobin Manor. And those Tuesday deliveries are timed to coincide with the Northampton Public Schools meal programs. So it, it makes it more efficient for families uh, getting food already through those programs, that program with their children. Uh, there's also doorstep delivery that's available for those who register. And then Community Action Pioneer Valley helped us get set up at Jackson Street School very quickly. And they lent us a core crew of dependable staff members who might otherwise have had to be furloughed. Uh, so those people have become a core part of our team operating from Jackson Street School. So we've just started our seventh week at Jackson Street School. At this point, you might be wondering a little bit about comparable numbers. What are we seeing um, and how does it compare to before? Um, so whereas we used to give out an average of about 13,000 pounds of food a week from our Northampton location, at this point, we're giving out about 17,000 pounds of food and it's still we're, we're still very much in the growing phase. Uh, another way of looking at it, you might look at, well, how many individual visits would you see in the course of a month? 
In the past at the Survival Center, we would see about 2,300 individual visits in a month. Right now in our first month, we've seen 5,116 individual visits. One other metric, uh, you think about new clients, what, what would that look like? In the normal course of things before uh, COVID, we would typically see about 63 new clients coming to us on any given month, all year long. And this first month we saw 552. So 63 to 552. So finally, in the third stage, ramping up and settling in, we're kind of now looking to, you know, how much further we might need to expand to meet the need. Um, we've started to augment our infrastructure in the new arrangement so that we'll be ready for whatever that new need might be. We are not at capacity. I will say, if you need food, you should be coming to us. Please do not think that you're taking it away from somebody else who will go hungry. Uh, we have the food, we have the people, and now we have the infrastructure. And that has included in recent weeks, uh, we've added a loaner van from our friends at Ford of Northampton that are just said, here, take this van, use it for the foreseeable future, free of charge. We've moved an industrial refrigerator from our warehouse at the Survival Center to Jackson Street School. We're giving out meat and milk and other refrigerated and frozen foods. We've moved an outdoor storage unit on the premises to help move things around. We've got reusable stacking crates now for transporting food. A pallet jack has been loaned to us from our friends at Perfect Supplements. Just last week, at the end of the week, our dear friends at DA Sullivan and Sons that rebuilt our beautiful building 10 years ago, came over and installed two lovely solid ramps at Jackson Street School to help us move that 17,000 pounds of food a week up and down the little stairs in and out of the cafeteria. And uh, luckily nobody had fallen and now they really won't. And it's just beautiful and it's making things go really quickly. Um, we are giving out fresh burritos that we are purchasing from Bueno Isano so that everybody can have a little bit of pre-made and delicious local food. And starting next week, we will offer nutrient dense bone broth that we're purchasing from our friends at Belly of the Beast. Um, and this is part of the way that we try to give back within our local community to support businesses, restaurants when they're going through hard times as well. So it's win-win for everybody. So we're figuring out what's next. We're looking at the new needs and new constraints. We're thinking about someday we're gonna to need to move back into our building and imagining that we might have to retrofit it for some kind of outdoor distribution that would not be in the spring or summer, but would actually be in the winter months and what that might look like. And we're eager to expand on the partnerships that we're just developing now and um, learning from some of these lessons that we're getting to learn from at the moment. Um, and the last thing I'll say, if I might, is just for more information, we have a COVID-19 specific page on our website. It's got lots of details. We do get many, many questions every week about how people can be involved. Uh, so please do check out northamptonsurvival.org. Um, when people are eager to help, we're very grateful. And I will say that financial contributions really are all we can reasonably handle right now because they allow us to be flexible, to buy food, and we don't need to be um, physically present to receive it. And uh, we do have an ongoing photo essay that gives you a visual of everything I've just described that is right there on our COVID-19 page at northamptonsurvival.org. So I encourage you to check it out. And thank you very much for asking me to come talk to you. Heidi, thank you very much for sharing all of that. That was breathtaking. Um, before I comment, do uh, any of my colleagues on the committee want to share anything? Alex. Councillor Jarrett. Yes, thank you. Thank you, uh, Heidi, so much for this. Um, you uh, mentioned, it, so funding, it seems like you're getting enough funding is what we're hearing that, you know, you know you're getting contributions and um, is that, do you think that's gonna continue for the foreseeable future? That's a very good question. I, I don't know because, and I think none of us do, we, we don't, none of us have really lived through something quite like this. Um, yes, funding was, was very quick and generous and on the individual level, as well as the institutional funders. Um, I don't know what the momentum will be for something like that over time and whether it's kind of the type of thing that'll be spiking early and then dwindling down. I really don't know. Um, mm -hmm. But for now, we have the money to buy the food that we need to meet the need. Right. Um, and another question is, uh, how can, you know, your organization and the city work together further? And is there anything we in, uh, and on the, as the city council can do um, 
that you would think would be beneficial? Mm, thanks for asking. Well, the city has been a great partner in all sorts of ways, big and small, I must say. Um, I mean, the, the response of Jackson Street School and the, um, the response of the you know, CDBG funding, as well as simple things like letting us break the bag ban temporarily so that we could get the food out, uh, mm -hmm. plastic bags. Um, I, I think probably the most important thing I can think of right now is that you're all taking away my message and the knowledge of, of what this program is and helping to spread the word and spread the word beyond your own networks and beyond and beyond so that people understand you don't have to have been a survival center client before. If you've lost your job, if you're going hungry, if you just feel like you're worried about food, we're, we're there and we've eliminated every possible barrier that we have the ability to, to eliminate. So we are not making it any kind of difficulty to come and get food if you need it. So help us spread the word. Okay, thank you. Karen, Councillor Foster. Thank you, Heidi, for being here. Um, and, and I have truly marveled at what you've done to ramp up. Um, and just to, to follow up with your answer to Councilor Jarrett's question, um, I know for people, uh, their first visit to the Survival Center, um, you know, reaching out and asking for help is probably fairly intimidating. And I'm wondering if you can just take a minute to walk through what someone would expect. So if, if someone's feeling like they need assistance and they, and they come for the first time to one of the distribution sites, um, do they need proof of residency or income or what could they expect um, to, to have happen? Super, great question. Thank you for that. Um, yeah, I think I'll just answer about during this weird time, which yeah. is so, so different from what they would experience at the survival center. And unfortunately, we don't have the ability to be as like personally face-to-face -face welcoming as we would normally be and, and pride ourselves on being. But at the same time, we also have almost no requirements uh, of the type that you mentioned. So um, basically a car, somebody will come in their car and if you aren't driving a car, you are also welcome to come. You do have to sort of stand in line with the cars and that's not the best thing, but at least you're not being very physically close to others. And then you'll sort of loop around. Um, there's a traffic volunteer who will just guide you in your route. And eventually you'll come up to an intake table where you, where you will be warmly greeted by Artemis, one of our staff people, and she will simply ask you your name and how many people in your family. If you're brand new, she'll ask you uh, for your address, and that's just so we can add you to our database and welcome you more warmly the next time, and you won't even have to answer that question the next time. It'll just be your name and the number of people, and then you'll be directed to drive one more car length down, and um, you may be occasionally given a small choice. As I mentioned, we're not really able to do the choice pantry we did, were before, but in some cases you might be asked like, would you like pork, choc pork chops or poultry today? Or something about that at that level of decision. Would you like a bean and, bean and cheese burrito or would you like a, a chicken burrito kind of question? And then, um, and then you'll be helped with the food and you'll be, you know, uh, thank you for coming and we'll hope to see you next week. And it's, it's that simple. So you don't need to bring any kind of um, ID. In fact, if you did, we wouldn't, try to take it or handle it from you, you'll, you'll be in your car the whole time. Um, so it's quite simple. And we look forward to greeting you at our usual location after this is all over, if you're still in need. Uh, and we'll, we'll get to know you better. Okay. Um, Councillor Thorpe? No, Jim, I think I'm good because I wanted you to get through all of the uh, speakers first. Yeah, but, yeah, we have quite a lineup. <laughs> you got um. a, quite a lineup here. You give them 15 minutes each, but I can tell you that Heidi did a great job. And, you know, my questions are pretty much, I think she, she answered, which is, you know, how has COVID-19 been impacting and affecting your agencies? Have you seen an increase in the request for your services? And how can people watching this get involved into volunteer? So I'll be, that's a general uh, question that I think that um, all the participants uh, are able to answer tonight. So thank you. Thank you. And, um, and, and Heidi, I'd like, I, I'm so grateful that this is being recorded because the amount of information you just shared, I can actually go back and watch it again. So, <laughs> oh, I appreciate that. Thank you. <laughs> Anyway, so thank you for uh, the information you presented and, uh, and, 
as somebody who's volunteered there, it's a great place to volunteer. And um, thank you for being here today. My pleasure, thank you. Okay. All right, next up on our star-studded uh, lineup is the, the United Way of Hampshire County. And uh, representing the United Way is uh, John Bidwell. Uh, John, are you, is your mic unmuted? Can you hear me okay? Yeah, there you are. Okay. Um, so, uh, John, tell us a, a little about what the United Way has been up to during the, the COVID crisis. So um, I'm going to take a step back and explain basically that the United Way primarily focuses on issues of poverty and near poverty. Um, it's a good reminder to, to know that even before COVID-19, which means if you go back just only a couple of months, 40% of our neighbors live in poverty or near poverty. It's, it's pretty amazing. So as you can imagine with COVID-19, the number of people that have the needs that are associated with poverty and near poverty are, are only going up. So the amount of requests that are coming to us are only going up as well. Um, almost everything, over 90% of everything that we donate back to the community is related to those things. So when COVID-19 hit, um, it's also good to remember that the United Way of Hampshire County really focuses on how do we support agencies in Hampshire County that are tackling poverty and near poverty in a way that gives them the support that they can't find elsewhere. So a lot of times we're giving them funding that they can't find through grants. Uh, we're giving them startup funding for new programs. We're giving them um, advice and connections in order to grow. Uh, and, and to advance the causes that, again, help people in poverty and near poverty. Um, so what happened with COVID-19 is that basically there was a frantic rush and there was a huge need that grew right out of that. And whereas typically we're sort of a well-oiled machine of like, okay, we have a certain amount of money every year, people apply for grants, we give them the grants and we make sure that it's for three-year cycles. It's very well coordinated in order to support the agencies we're suddenly flooded with a rush of emergency requests. And we decided when the emergency requests came through that we would meet them as best we could, regardless of whether those requests were coming from our partner agencies, which are the ones that we fund or not. So this became, this I think was totally the right response. The board was on, uh, my board that supports me was very much uh, supportive of this as well. So we ended up getting involved with projects that frankly we wouldn't normally get involved with, but under the circumstances, it was a dire need and we did it. A good example was the shelter at the high school in Northampton. So we were approached because the people involved with the shelter were having troubles finding volunteers to both open the shelter and to sustain the shelter. We have a lot of connections. They approached us on a Friday. We were able to get enough promotion out through the Gazette, through our own uh, lines of communication to get 90 volunteers within the span of about a week to both not only open the shelter, but to sustain it, um, which has gone very well. We were also able to find um, a couple of the last hand washing stations in the area, and we also paid for those. And we were also uh, able to have some hand sanitizer made and distributed at a time when of course we hit a lull and those were hard to find. We also um, received, a, we also uh, were contacted by a few people about Grow Food Northampton and the Survival Center because as you just heard, there was a lot going on there and there needed to be an immediate response in the community. And so um, we were asked if we could make donations. We got in touch with some of our key donors and we also made grants which totaled $25,000. The other thing that came along was that people wanted volunteer opportunities. They were like, I want to volunteer. I want to give back. I want to know where that can happen. So we were able to stand up a volunteer database associated with our web website that would link people who were looking to give back with those who needed more help. I would say that all of the requests that are coming to us are coming on three different levels. One of the levels that I just mentioned is from agencies who are not normally associated with us but that we've chosen to support nonetheless. The second is through our partner agencies, the ones that we already fund and the ones that we support. And those requests are numerous. It's everything from finding funding to supporting some individual um, uh, fundraising that they're doing on their own, to especially finding volunteers. That's something we're very good at doing. And then the third thing that people are asking is for our individuals coming to us and asking us for help because they don't know who else to go to. 
Um, again, we're very good at finding volunteers and we're very good at finding resources in short order. We had a woman who called three weeks ago saying, I could not find size six diapers and I can fi not find disposable di uh, underwear for women. Had been looking for a week and a half, was distraught. We were able to find them within a couple of hours. She was, she was very moved. So as you can imagine, these requests are coming from on high, everything from tens of thousands of dollars to is something as simple as a diaper. So what do we see going forward? Um, we see the requests only increasing. Again, if we use poverty and near poverty as our measuring stick, we can assume that the number of people who are gonna be encountering those issues is only going to go up. Hello, 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 hello. Hello, what? And uh, um, uh, so the other thing, so we're gonna to need to respond to that. We also have, we give out grants every year. Our primary concern right now is meeting the grant promises that we've made to our partner agencies. We work with 30 agencies doing 35 programs across Hampshire County, all related to poverty and near poverty. And we need the funding to make sure that we can fulfill those grant requests. That is something that we have done every single year. This is the first year when we're concerned that we may not be able to hit that. So we're obviously looking for funding to make sure that we can secure the grants, which we've promised. We also are looking for extra funding because we are being asked to do more. So normally uh, we're looking to bring in a million and a quarter a year. We're looking to bring in a million and a half this year. So we're gonna continue to provide as much as we can across the board to whoever comes to us. Um, but we also are working our darndest to make sure that we fulfill the grant promises that we've made to our partner agencies. Um, I think that's an, a good overview. I, I, I want to come in under my time in case there's other questions and to make sure that other people have the time they need. John, thank you for sharing. And uh, to my colleagues, uh, do you have any questions for Director Bidwell? Yes, Councillor Nash, can I go? Go right ahead. Thank Come you. To the floor. Thank you, Mr. Bidwell, for being here this evening. Now, I know you uh, mentioned about fulfilling the grant promises. Um, is there a link or an online or for a way for people to donate uh, to the United Way? Yeah, so if you uh, go to your browser and just punch in United Way Hampshire County, we live in Hampshire County, just remember United Way Hampshire County, mm -hmm. it'll take you to our website. You can find out about the donations. You can also find out about volunteer opportunities. It's all linked on the homepage. Thank you. You're welcome, thank you. Counselors, any other questions? I have a quick one. Go ahead. Um, with the volunteer opportunities that you have, do you find, um, I guess I'm curious what the sort of flow is between willing and able volunteers and the need for volunteers. How is, how is that going? Um, so let me, can you give me an example, please? Yeah, I guess I'm just, um, I recognize that United Way is helping to fill volunteer opportunities um, throughout Hampshire County. And I'm curious if you have many more opportunities than you do volunteers, or if you have, you know, so I guess um, sort of what is the gulf between need for volunteers and volunteers who are contacting you looking for opportunity? Yeah, what we're finding is that the volunteer uh, situation sort of goes in waves, meaning that we'll get a wave of people who are interested in volunteering, and then we'll get a wave of need. Um, and we not only talk about uh, what the volunteer opportunities are on our website, we also push it out in a, in a weekly e-newsletter. So the other thing I would recommend doing is if you get in, got on our website and you want to know specifically what's needed for that week, sign up for our e-newsletter and we'll get that out to you because sometimes the requests are coming in and they need to be filled quickly. If I just put them up, we just put them on the website, it might be two weeks before someone finds it. But if we push out an e-newsletter, e we find we get a very fast response. A lot of them are for drivers. The thing to remember with volunteers is that um, the volunteer pool has changed. Older volunteers are rightfully staying at home. Younger volunteers who are college students have gone home. They're not around any longer. Anyone who has a compromised immune system is no longer available. So that number of volunteers has, has shrunk and the volunteers need to know that they're being safe. So they're, they're gonna be interested in finding out not only what the volunteer opportunities are, but are, they, are all the precautions being taken to make sure that they're safe? And that's another thing that we've been working with the partner agencies on is what are the protocols that are being put in place to make sure that that safety is maintained? 
But in terms of um, an actual sort of algorithm as to the need, uh, it, to be honest, it fluctuates. It comes, it ups, goes up and goes down. Thank you. Thank you, John. Uh, any, anyone else? Okay. Um, so, uh, John, I'd like to thank you for sharing all of that information today. Um, the United Way has clearly been up to uh, supporting a lot of different efforts here. It, it, you've been connected with both the Survival Center um, and I've heard Grow Food mentioned a few times that you've been connected with them. And um, so I appreciate you showing up today and sharing all of this good news and ways people can be involved. I really appreciate it, everybody. Again, there's a lot of hard work going on out there and we can't thank everybody enough. Thanks. Thank, thank you. you. Okay, John, feel free to stick around um, and uh, or go eat dinner or go feed Dudley. <laughs> and um, that next up we have Safe Passage and we have Marianne Winters here. Marianne, are you unmuted? Or let's see, maybe I can unmute you here. Or maybe- I, I yeah, I think I'm unmuted now. Hi, I'm Marianne. Okay, I'm unmuting you while you are unmuting. All right. Okay, all right. Two Welcome. unmutes, yes. Thank you, thank you. Thank you so much for having me and for your interest in um, survivors of domestic violence that um, well, are especially at risk these days. So yes, so I, I'm a pleasure to be here. Um, as Safe Passage, you may know the general outline of what we do. We work on the impact of domestic violence on individuals and families. So that includes our community-based services, um, counseling, legal support, um, legal representation, children's advocacy, support groups. And these are this is all for people who are living in community um, in Hampshire County and the hill towns beyond Hampshire County. Um, in some sort of, in some range of um, dangerousness around domestic violence. They may be, you know, seeing precursors or warning signs. They may be in the aftermath. So we work with people in that whole range. And then the other way that we address the impact is with a um, residential shelter. It's a domestic violence emergency shelter. It's in one of the neighborhoods in Northampton. And, um, serves up to six families at any one time when there's not a pandemic. <laughs> so um, the other end of our programmatic services, it's our community engagement work. This is where we organize our volunteers. We do trainings for the general community, for professionals. We do a lot of prevention work, communications, and so on. So those are our program areas. Um, we started you know, thinking about and um, taking precautions around coronavirus very early. Um, before we went remote, we we did um, training sessions that were age appropriate on how to wash your hands for every shelter guest, um, including the toddlers. So they had little songs that were 20 seconds long and figured out how to do that. Um, we did what we could to um, increase our um, sanitation um, to identify what we could do to social distance. And then um, in mid-March, um, we went essentially remote. Um, we, have, we have a skeletons crew in our um, community office, which is 76 Carlin Drive, um, which just means one person there from 9 a.m. to noon, because there are just some things that need to happen in the office. Um, clients signing releases of information or picking up diapers or um, mail coming and being distributed. Um, our mail is for the organization and many of our clients end up using our address temporarily for all of their correspondence. So that's housing applications, social security, you know, the, all of the things that people sort of need to conduct their, uh, their financial, social life, all of that. So when we went remote, we um, got in, our counselors got in touch with all of their clients, their ongoing clients, and set up um, remote telephone meetings. Um, some of them had to change their schedules because while we went remote, very often um, the client, you know, our clients went remote 
and very often they're the person that they were living with who potentially is abusing them went remote. So the nature of our work in many ways has stayed the same, but there's some real added risks and there's some changes in how we approach those conversations in terms of safety planning. Um, so you can imagine that you know, one of our one of the most consistent things that we do is um, um, we've it's become a verb around around safe passage. We, we safety plan with people. This means talking with them about what their options are, what their what their dangerousness level is. We reflect back to them. You know, if they sort of tell us different conditions that are happening, we might you know pull out some you know some information that we might know from data. We might say something like you know. We know that other people in a situation that you've just described um, find themselves at very high risk. And so we help people really kind of assess their risk and also assess what their options are. Very often, one of the, you know, one of the main options when violence may escalate or when warning signs may be growing is leaving the house you know, or finding a neighbor, going to a mall, going to the police station, going to a library. Um, so many of those options that were kind of worked out with the person, you know, are no longer available to them. So, but the first week we did a, we had a training session with all of our counselors. We gathered up um, sort of national data and information about safety planning while in contact with, with an abuser. And so we've been, we trained our counselors on ways to talk about that, ways to acknowledge what might be different, ways to acknowledge how to stay, how to keep stay safer, um, how to signal a friend, um, things like developing a code phrase with a friend. So, you know, one one thing that people might use is, you know, I'm gonna I may call you and say and ask, are you still delivering pizza today? And that means please call the police and have someone come to our house. So, um, each person really kinds of you know we encourage them to think through. And th those kinds of um, those those kinds of um, you know options for themselves, and also think through how they actually might engage in um, self defense in the most empowering way that they can. Um, messages like you know we have information that if violence is happening in someone's home, the most dangerous places are kitchens and bathrooms. So if at all possible, if something escalated. Stay in, a, stay in a bedroom or a place where there might be more cushy furniture than sharp objects or countertops. And um, these, are, these are horrible things to have to help people think through and talk through, but it actually might mean the difference between a severe injury and maybe a minor injury or um, an assault. Um, we also talk with people about how in that moment you may have to de-escalate. That might mean as humiliating as that sounds, apologizing for something that wasn't your fault, saying, "Oh, dinner was dinner was burnt. I'm so sorry. What can, what can, else could I make for you?" You know, and that's something that it hurts someone's pride, but it may actually reduce the seriousness of um, of violence. So the nature of what people are thinking about in those counseling sessions has definitely changed, and our counselors have been highly trained. They have meetings every day um, with each other and with the director of our community programs to really talk through those things because they're finding that they need a lot more um, case sharing, ideas from each other, what might work, and um, you know interconnections with each other. Um, we also made some made an adjustment to our hotline based in other community resources that could cover um, around the edges of that, but. Um, we wanted the same group of counselors who were doing that ongoing work to actually be staffing the hotline. So our hotline is now um, open and operational from 11 a.m. to 7 p.m. So that's reduced from 24 hours, but the amount of work or the, the substance of that session is much deeper. Um, and then we've engaged um, the resources. There's a statewide hotline that people can call off hours. The, um, there's a national hotline that also does, um, that does text chat through a, through a um, secure and um, encrypted um, platform. So we engage with them. So, um, so while we're not 
physically in Northampton answering that you know that hotline, we have um, friends around who are who are and then can refer back to us. So um, also in our community program, the nature of what people are thinking about and what they need to plan on has changed. Be, you know, in addition to figuring out how to stay safer when you can't necessarily escape, um, there people are also thinking about uh, what arrangements do they need to make if they actually do get sick, if they die. Um, there are many people who, and this is probably been the most heart wrenching way that we've had to shift our thinking is actually talking with people about those possibilities. Where will your kids go if you get sick and if you are in the hospital? Um, and making arrangements, um, identifying guardians, um, if that's at all possible, making arrangements with that person. Um, there may be people who might be, you know, the potential guardianship guardian in theory, you know, when people, you know, if you're a responsible parent, you talk to someone else in the family about like, you know, it's the conversation, if something were to happen to me, but you really don't think that that's going to be necessary. That those plans are very different because someone might say, if you get sick, I, you know, normally I might be the guardian for your child, but I live with my elderly mother and you know, we're quarantining and we wouldn't be able to expose my, my elderly mother to, to another person. So <laughs> we work with people. And um, so, so we're, we're teaching, our, we've taught our counselors about the legal paperwork around guardianships, wills, health proxies. Um, you know, we've had a couple of clients who, you know, are fearful of, um, you know, violence at home but then really do not want the person who's abusing them making end of life decisions um, that they, they don't feel like that would be safe for them. So, so that's an example of what I mean by like the nature of, of the work that we're doing is, um, is different and harder and takes a lot more um, interaction among our counselors to, to just kind of work that through. Um, we're also seeing examples um, so one of the dynamics of domestic violence is that people who use abuse may use a way that a person is marginalized as like one tool of that abuse. So an example might be uh, someone who's abusing, you know, the, the victim may be someone with a disability. That abuser might have control over an assistive device that helps that person be mobile. Um, that person may unplug the, um, the battery charger of the wheelchair so that that person can't go to work the next day or um, may cancel, cancel a home health aid appointment so that they, they, you know, they can't um, do the things normally that they would do in a day. Um, so the, the uh, COVID is, seems to be, I mean, and, and as, um, as sad and troubling as this sounds, um, almost kind of another tool that some people are using abuse is actually using against the, the survivor. So, um, you know, not wearing a mask and, you know, the saying, well, I'm going to go out anywhere I want. And if I, and maybe I'll bring COVID home to you and there's nothing you can do about that. Um, things like that, that, you know, threatening people. We, we saw this around AIDS and HIV. And so, I mean, I'm surprised, but I feel like I shouldn't be surprised. So those are some examples. Um, in our shelter, we have worked, we've been working nearly constantly with both the Department of Public Health and with the Homelessness Network to um, envision and support changes in congregate living situations. You know, you've been hearing about the problems with nursing homes. Emergency shelters, homeless shelters, our congregate living situations also um, with a bunch of kids who, you know, wouldn't keep a mask on and uh, with people coming and going. So we've had to really make some changes into in our actual residential environment. We resituated everyone who was in shelter because we had way more people than we could safely social distance at first. We resituated them into a, a hotel, and then a couple weeks into that stay, we um, 
we actually got thrown out because that that hotel was kind of commandeered as a as a um, isolation um, fever shelter um, hotel hospital. So um, by then we came back to the shelter. We are working now on trying to put as many more resources toward actually getting people housed and then um, be able to have a little bit more um, a different kind of screening so that if people are coming to live in a congregate living situation, we can do some free screening and feel um, and have some quarantine time before that. Um, we're in the process of figuring that out and, and getting support from the Department of Public Health and from MEMA to um, make that safe. Um, we've also been working a lot on access to resources, um, finding out who is doing what differently. So all of the resources that people need to carry out their lives and for their well-being, we're tracking um, how food distribution has changed and how um, DTA and um, you know the um, homelessness resources, everything is changing in terms of hours and distribution and contact people. Um, so all of that economics. Um, and we also have been, um, you know, we've been working a lot on our own secession planning, knowing full well that people may get sick, um, knowing full well that people um, don't know if they're going to be able to work full time, if their kids are going to be, you know, now we pretty much know they're not going to camp, but at first we didn't know if they were going to be, how long they were going to be out of school or daycare. So um, we're doing a lot of that work to track like what people's status is every day and, um, you know, where, you know, where they are so that we can keep up the commitments that we set in place. Um, so that's, that's kind of a, you know, rough outline of what it is that we're, um, we're dealing with and going through. Marianne, thank you for sharing all of that. That yeah. was, again, you guys are piling on with the information. I, I, I learning a lot from uh, the, the presenters here. And uh, I'm going to ask my colleagues if they have any questions or thoughts. Go ahead, uh, Councillor Jared. Oh, thank you so much. I, I feel like pleasure. I have so much more information now um, about Safe Passage and I really appreciate that. Um, I guess my question is, you know, what kind of messaging can we as on the council do? Uh, what, what is gonna be most helpful? Um, for, for safe passage? That's a great question. Thank you for that. So I, um, so we have, we know that there are people that just are not, where it's not safe for them to call us. And so we are trying to get messaging out in as many venues as we possibly can. Um, we recently had a, an op-ed published in the Gazette that kind of, you know, described some of the issues around safety planning with an abuser. Um, I certainly could pass on that. And if there are any publications or emails, or if that's something that the city could put on their website, that would be great information. We are, we are getting a lot more um, um, hits on our, on, I guess, is there another word other than hits on your website? You know, because Safe Passage would, would, um, would use a different word than that, but we're getting a lot of links um, or click-ins to our, to our website. And, um, so that's one thing, messaging. Another messaging is um, um, how to help someone, like how to help someone break their isolation if you know. So we have messaging for survivors themselves and also for anybody who knows or cares about a survivor. Um, the key, you know, the opposite very often of violence is not necessarily lack of violence, it's connection. So one of the things that people can do if they know somebody is, um, is experiencing violence or they suspect is arrange like a check-in. Um, it could even be, hey, I'm gonna play words with friends you know, every day and you can, you know, you can, you can put, it, put something in that chat box you know, if, I, if I need to know, something like that, that, that lets people know that there's a, you could be a touch point for people. So, so to bystanders in the community and to survivors, um, definitely message, messaging would be helpful. Counselors? Yeah. Everybody else good? Oh, 
Councillor Foster. Last minute, um, got my hand up. Thank you so much for, for sharing all of this. I, I have been thinking about Safe Passage and the work you're doing, recognizing that it's far more challenging when people are, are isolated, um, you know, potentially in unsafe situations. And this is not um, quite what you were talking about, but another thing that I'm concerned about is parental stress. Um, mm -hmm. And I'm wondering if you know or could share any resources um, for, for parents who are also, um, you know, dealing with their own stress, because I, I would imagine that um, similar to domestic violence, um, you know, the stresses that are impacting children are also uh, a challenge. Yes. Um, thank you for that, because, you know, in many ways, this is, you know, COVID is um, a perfect storm for increasing stress and for, um, you know, even emotional abuse or physical abuse. Um, I know that there are parenting stress, li you know, stress lines. Um, I know that some schools have set up some resources. I don't have them off the top of my head, but those are some resources that we've been checking out and kind of referring people, you know, based on where they live. Um, the Hilltown community um, has a great newsletter for rural um, folks where there are activities, there's, you know, Zoom calls on different topics, there's stuff that, um, you know, gets people to connect around puzzles or games or things like that. Um, a lot of times it's about connecting people with each other. So two families getting together on, on a video call and telling jokes or things like that can really kind of break that day-to-day -day isolation. Um, so, but I, I, I can't really say right off the top of my head where those you know, other kinds of resources are. I do know that there's, well, an, another resource that I know a lot of our um, folks who work with parents um, are, are using our resources about, you know, like really simple craft projects you can make, things you can make out of newspaper or, um, you know, things that you might have around the house and have a parade in your funny hats or things like that. So, um, you know, we also find it's, it's, it's interesting because when we're looking for kids resources, it's pretty common and, you know, relatively easy to find things to occupy younger kids with. And then the older they get, the more difficult it is. If the child isn't, doesn't, can't, doesn't have access to sports or doesn't have a basketball hoop out in their backyard, um, we always have trouble um, finding ways that are really like interesting and age appropriate for teenagers. And that's whether we're doing a holiday gift giving, you know, um, drive or um, other kinds of activities. So um, things that feel like cool and developmental and like social for, Teenagers is always a, um, a gap for them. Councillor Thor? Good, thank you, I'm all set. Okay, so uh, Marianne, thank you for sharing that. And one of the things that you mentioned that really uh, uh, stood out for me is that as, you know, as a provider in the community, how our network is kind of blown up, you know, that right. those things that you, those go-tos, aren't there anymore. There aren't libraries, there aren't coffee mm -hmm. shops, there's there's that right. program at that particular place isn't there anymore. And that as we're trying to build connections with the community, that you have to pull out the, make a new playbook. So, right. um, and I, yeah. I hear you guys doing that. Well, so. thank you. So I had a couple of other ideas, if I can have like 30 more seconds. Um, 30 seconds, okay. So one, you know, we're obviously thinking toward the holiday season and the hot chocolate run. We know that, you know, by December, it's not going to be the time to bring together 6,500 of our closest friends. So one thing that we, we know we'll be um, wanting to have conversations with you about is how can we do some kind of an event um, that meets some of those needs, but we also know that we're not going to be able to raise the amount of money that we normally would with that event. So, um, so that's one thing we're working on. The other thing we're, we're thinking about is how and when to reconstitute our office. And um, a key thing for that is, you know, a key, a key thing that, you know, seems like we're going to need is access to testing. And we don't know, and so, so anything that the city can do to advocate for that, to push the governor's office or something to have access for testing 
for human service workers, people who, um, because if, you know, if we're ever going to get back to having individual counseling sessions, which really is the best way in person to connect with people, you can take care of a lot of business, but you also can make a connection. You know, can we do that without um, access to testing? Um, so that's one thing. And then we, we had um, a great interaction with um, the fire department around getting masks. We actually ended up having the National Guard deliver some masks for us, um, but we we're having a huge trouble um, getting a supply of cleaning supplies for both the shelter and the office. Um, and also we have to do some renovation for both the office and the shelter, um, even after return, things like, um, you know, um, water faucets with sensors rather than so that we can decrease the amount of touching that there is, especially the ones that kids use, things like that. So we're looking for ways to, um, to fund those changes. If we you know, do some plexiglass within the, off, within the shelter office, perhaps that could make interactions in the shelter a little bit safer, um, things like that. So that's, um, those are some other um, key things you're asking the question, how can, how can we help? Right. So Marianne, I, I want to thank you for sharing that. And also that the previous presenter had talked about being able to work miracles of coming up with different things through the United Way. And, mm -hmm. um, and I'm going to segue to our next presenter, which is the Western Mass Mutual Aid uh, Group. And let's see, where's Sherilyn? There she is. Hi. And um, and so uh, I'm going to let Sherilyn, you know, Sherilyn uh, uh, represents a group that is all about building networks and communication. And um, that uh, in terms of getting those cleaning supplies, maybe she knows of a way to do it. So uh, anyway, Marianne, thank you. And thank you so Sherilyn, much. you're up. Yeah. Uh, so like you said, uh, we uh, formed in reaction to COVID just by a lot of people who are concerned um, by the situation, uh, rightfully so. Um, and uh, as a way to try to find uh, networks to share goods and services and to help our communities uh, become more inter interdependent um, in the face of uh, this global challenge with uh, really an unforeseen end. Um, so examples of like what's been going on um, include, um, well, we have a lot of projects going on, um, but uh, some examples that um, are most relevant to Northampton um, are, um, neighborhood pods. So um, there are quite a few in Northampton. So I would encourage everyone on the call to go and check out the website, um, wmacma.com slash maps. I think acronyms are not my uh, number or, one skill. Um, just use Google but, and Western yeah. Mass Mutual Aid and you'll, that's how I exactly. got it. Uh, but there's likely one on your street um, and what their purpose is to have a few um, an organizer or a couple organizers um, for your street or your block um, to help people uh, connect uh, a neighbor to get groceries get to doctor's appointments or really just like any uh, pressing needs um, within that area um, and obviously like not every need can be met within that um, small community. So there have also been, we have a larger database um, that we can, can, we have people searching through all the time um, and we can connect people to throughout the larger valley. Um, but that's one thing that's going on. Um, and then another thing that uh, project that's been going on in Northampton is, um, uh, delivery of meals in Northampton. This has been going on almost daily um, and it's been entirely volunteer um, driven and funded. Um, there are about 15 volunteers working on it 
to deliver meals. Examples have been, um, I think, like mac and cheese, PB and J, um, or just like really anything that they could find in stores and in. Um, they've been delivered in containers around dinner time, um, and. Uh, but this isn't really like a super sustain sustainable project um, since uh, it's something that like with everything, like people burn out really fast um, because it's really hard to like at, since it's a volunteer organization, well, not really organization, but it's a volunteer group. Um, so they're adding that on to their own personal lives and everything that's going on. And um, so um, there was a grant that they received and they're looking to um, figure out how to distribute it. But um, until then it's still being funded by everyone. Um, so that's a way people can get involved, but I also think it would be great to find a way to maybe collaborate with the city on finding solutions to that. Um, but um, on the topic of money, another thing that, um, of course, like a, the, um, whatchamacallit, the stimulus package, um, it's not enough for most people. Um, and so, um, we have a mutual aid fund that has just been um, added to by grassroots donors um, and people can request um, funds through a hotline that's been running with the Pioneer Valley Worker Center. So there are people who can answer in English or Spanish. Um, and um, they're working on figuring out a process to get um, money out. Um, and the ideal situation would be to get uh, money out um, in monthly rounds, but of course that's super dependent on how much money uh, we get in. And um, yeah, so that's how that's been going. Um, but yeah. It was so Yasmin was going to call in, right? Is Yasmin on the line here? No, she couldn't make it. Okay, all right. And uh, so, um, so Sherilyn, in terms of we, when we talked earlier today, um, the 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 I the perception I had of Western Mass Mutual Aid is it's trying to create. It's it's not so much an organization that's providing a particular service, it's an organization that's trying to aid organization. And that, so uh, um, as I was telling uh, John Bidwell earlier, it's kind of like it's the solar system, while it was still dust and held together by gravity, Western Mass Mutual Aid showed up and, you know, helped form the sun and the, the planets and things like that. So then the system started working. Um, and you mentioned there's a, so there's the these pods, uh, which there's a map on your website so that people can go see pod members. And um, throughout Northampton, there seems to be pod members pretty well geographically placed around the city. And it would be a great way for neighbors to get involved uh, with building a network or along their street and in their neighborhood uh, to be able to figure out whether people need food or whatever, you know, whatever support they might need. The other thing is you mentioned a platform called Slack and yeah. that Slack is used by the, the group that's uh, providing the meals. Did I have that right? Yeah. So um, basically, um, if people go to our website, they'll find obviously the map, um, but there's also um, ways that they can sign up to volunteer. Um, so you can either just say, I have this good or service that I'm willing to donate, or you can join in the Slack channels. And uh, so the, there are various projects going on. So you can connect with people in your towns, 
or you can join in on different ongoing projects and donate your time um, to um, the efforts that are going on there. Um, and uh, there's a lot going on. Um, I guess some examples of what's going on um, are like uh, trying to give more education resources and uh, community gardening. Um, and um, there was uh, some efforts on tenants' rights um, and organizing around that. So there were a lot of different um, things going on. Okay. Um, all right, I already did some questions. So to my colleagues, do you have any questions for Sherilyn? Hi, Sherilyn. Hi. Hi, so um, Western Massachusetts Community Mutual Aid, uh, do they cover Hamden, Hampshire and Franklin counties? Yeah, um, so there's a Berkshire County Mutual Aid, but uh, we are uh, working all throughout the Pioneer Valley. Okay. And do you find a need, is there a need right now for uh, volunteers? Yeah, okay. uh, there's a big, big need for volunteers because since it's all um, an entirely volunteer uh, group, mm -hmm. um, people, um, and it's such like a difficult, task to think about like how COVID-19 is affecting everyone. Um, there's a constant need um, for resurgence and um, projects that are going on. Okay. Thank you. Okay, other counselor. I see Alex, uh, Councillor Jarrett leaning towards his screen. <laughs> Trying to unmute. <laughs> yes. Um, so Sherilyn, I just want to really thank you for, for being a part of this. Um, I know in my neighborhood, um, we've just started a neighborhood pod and I'm heartened by the, the possibility of, you know, of connection now in this time, but um, you know, we just established a mailing list for our neighborhood, which is something I've been wanting to do for years. So this is really um, <clears throat> bringing things together. And I think that, that will bring neighbors together beyond this current crisis as well. Um, and I've also seen, I, I helped some, um, a pod figure out uh, who was over 65 in their neighborhood to make sure that they reached out to each one of those uh, people. So I'm, I'm really impressed by all the different work and the connections that this has brought. So thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? All right. Uh, so, uh, Sherilyn, I want to thank you for joining us today, and um, that um, you're a great that Western Mass Mutual Aid is a great resource for people who are looking for ways to start to get organized. And that, um, and also uh, one last question. So you mentioned, I, I heard you mentioned something about city council possibly helping out in a certain way, or the city. What was that specifically? Yeah, so I think like in terms of like delivering meals like on a regular basis, it's kind of hard. Um, so I feel like it would be good to brainstorm ways to um, make that process a little easier. Um, and so I think um, I've seen cities like Holyoke and Detroit um, create COVID-19 recovery task forces with residents. Um, and so I feel like that would be a good way maybe for Northampton to address different issues that are coming up and continue the collaboration between like these groups that were on the call tonight um, and different people that maybe weren't on the call tonight, um, but have um, their own different needs in the community. Okay, interesting. All right. Well, and also I, uh, I, I can see two people on the screen here uh, who um, are dealing with food security, both the, the Survival Center and Grow Food is here, and I'd be happy to work with you to engage in uh, reaching out to them uh, around, maybe there's ways to uh, help um, with some of that uh, meal delivery that you were talking about. And the Survival Center is raising their hand. Heidi, would you like to 
weigh in. Thanks, Jim. I just thought I should mention and, and brought to Sherilyn and also just broadly, um, one thing that we do want to promote is that people can send, people in need of food uh, security can send a friend, a neighbor, somebody else on their behalf to pick up food, for example, at Jackson Street School through the uh, Community Food Distribution Project. So it's the kind of thing that uh, Northampton Neighbors has been looking into, uh, perhaps the mutual aid group, um, others who want to learn more about what we're doing, spread the word, and then come on behalf of somebody who's struggling, not for prepared meals necessarily, but for groceries to do their own home cooking. So, Thank you. Uh, John Bidwell. Yeah, and a quick, uh, uh, Sherilyn, I know the work you're doing is fantastic. I've been, I've been in touch with the group and following it. Um, again, if you need volunteers, just feel free to reach out to me. and We'd be glad to promote it out to our group. Um, and I'm sure we can get someone to help you. Thanks. Councillor Jarrett. Yeah, to Sherilyn's idea of a COVID-19 task force um, or something of that nature, um, for a future meeting, I wonder if we might want to consider um, thoughts of a select committee that the council could establish or recommending to the mayor that, that a task force be established. Um, <clears throat> so something perhaps for a future agenda. It is something we could discuss um, since it's not on the agenda, but I'd, I'd be happy to discuss it with you, Councillor Jarrett, after our meeting. So, um, so Sherilyn, thank you for uh, sharing uh, about Western Mass Mutual Aid today, and um, and also I just I just really love the way that we had resources right here that <laughs> that we could just tap on and um, and and that the resources were reaching out to other resources. So um, anyway, um, I, I'd like to thank all of our presenters. And, um, and at this point, I would like to release the presenters to go eat dinner, to go feed the dog, <laughs> to go take a walk, don't forget your mask, and, um, and to have a nice meeting, a uh, nice uh, evening. And then um, we just, uh, and then I'm just gonna wrap up the meeting here with my colleagues. So. Thank you so uh, much. Cheryl, Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everybody. Marianne, thank you for being here. So, um, and as far as my colleagues, um, that uh, one of the things I was re re regretted, regretting that I didn't see on the agenda, and it kind of related to exactly what Councillor Jarrett was talking about, which is um, discussion of future agendas, <laughs> and that um, I, I uh, but uh, Laura and I discussed what I could say is that I could show my hand a little, which is I, I found this very successful. And I'll be reaching out to each one of you uh, to discuss um, uh, repeating some of this for our next meeting and, um, and discussing uh, you know, possible uh, different variations on some of, the, uh, some of the things that were recommended tonight, which like as Alex brought up. So um, that's my thoughts, and um, and we've covered everything on the agenda here. Um, so I want to thank everybody for showing up. And um, would somebody like to make a motion to adjourn? I'll make a motion. Okay, a second. Second. Okay. Uh, we need to do a roll call, right, Laura? Okay, go ahead. Oh, you're muted. Laura. Sorry, I forgot I was muted. Councillor Nash. Yes. Councillor Jarrett. Yes. Councillor Foster. Yes. And Councillor Thorpe. Yes. Okay. okay, thank you, everybody. The Community Resources Show is ending its productions for tonight. Um, and, uh, and I look forward to speaking with each of my colleagues here individually. So thanks, everybody. That was great. <laughs>